So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for welcoming me back here once again. It's great to be with you all. So today begins uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So please turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Feast of Tabernacles begins tonight. You may have also heard it called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Shelters in some Bible translations, but it's commonly known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot in Hebrew, a sukkah is a tabernacle singular and Sukkot is plural. So Leviticus 23, I just want to explain basically how these feasts work because God gave Israel seven feasts to observe. In Leviticus 23, we see all, all of them and uh, they had to observe these seven feasts annually. That's why you have the seven candles on the menorah. They, they represent the seven feasts of Israel. So each of these feasts, they have a, a past commemoration. They celebrate something from Israel's past. And they also have a future meaning to be fulfilled by the Messiah. Now, it's important to note that the first four of these feasts are celebrated in, in the spring. We have the spring feast, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost, Shavuot. Then you have a gap between them. You have that long, hot summer. That summertime corresponds to the time of the Gentiles. And then in the autumn, you then have the last three, the autumn feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then finally, the Feast of Tabernacles. So we have the three feasts in the in the spring, sorry, the, beg your pardon, the four feasts in the spring, and then the three, uh, three feasts in the autumn. Now, it's important to note that all of these feasts are fulfilled by the Messiah. However, the Messiah comes and fulfills the first four spring feasts at his first coming. At his first coming, he comes to fulfill the first four. But then he returns after the time of the Gentiles, after that long, hot summer, he returns to fulfill the final three feasts. So all of those feasts, as I said, they have a past celebration. For example, Passover remembers when Israel came out of Egypt through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. It represents that, the blood of the Lamb upon the doorpost, etc. But it's fulfilled by the Messiah at his crucifixion. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that Jesus is our Passover Lamb. You also have, for example, uh, Shavuot, the Feast of Pentecost. It commemorates the, uh, the, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. That's what it celebrates historically. However, we all know that the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, was fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So that's how these feasts work. They all celebrate something in the past, but they all are fulfilled by the Messiah when the Messiah comes, either at his first coming or his second coming. He fulfills the first four spring feasts at his first coming, and then he returns after the Gentile age to fulfill the final three feasts at his return. So that's how we must understand these feasts. Now it's important also to note that these feasts are kind of modelled around Israel's agricultural cycle. You, you basically have two harvest seasons in Israel, in, in ancient Israel. You have the spring harvest and the autumn harvest. The spring harvest is a harvest of wheat and that takes place at the time of, of the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. And that's why it's traditional uh, for the Jews to read the Book of Ruth in the, uh, in the synagogues on Shavuot because it takes place at the time of the harvest. And also there is the uh, autumn harvest, which takes place around the time of tabernacles, and that is a harvest of fruit. And you also have two rainy seasons before that as well. Before each harvest, you have a rainy season. Now we all know that rain and water in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. So there's tons of typology associated with these feasts. Let us go forth in Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 33. This is where we see the Feast of Tabernacles uh, being ordained here by God for the Jewish people to observe. Leviticus 23, from verse 33 through to 44. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. So he's saying that these are separate to the previous vows and offerings that he ordained before this. Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. So there you go, it takes place 
at the time of the fruit harvest in the autumn, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land. There shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. So it's a seven-day festival concluded with an eighth day of rest. The first day is considered a Sabbath, and the eighth day is also considered a Sabbath. Verse 40, And you shall take for yourselves on the first day of the fruit of the trees, branches of palm trees, the buffs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord, for your, your God, for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So it tells us here why we're celebrating it and how to celebrate it. The past commemoration that it has is it remembers the time when the Israelites dwelt in booths. They lived in tents, didn't they, during their time in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. And that's why we have these booths right here that you see that have been made out of biscuits. A very good job uh, by the children making these. This is what the Jewish people would traditionally construct. And they would live in these booths for seven days. They'd sleep and eat their meals in them. And because it takes place at the time of the fruit harvest, it's traditional to decorate the, uh, the sukkah, the booth, with, uh, with fruit and hanging bananas and grapes and stuff like that. So that's why we have the sukkah, is to remember the uh, time when the Israelites dwelt in booths. And as it said, it begins on the 15th day of the seventh month. The seventh month in the Hebrew calendar is Tishrei, the month of Tishrei, on the 15th day of the seventh month, which begins tonight. And it lasts for seven days and concludes with a, uh, a day of rest. Now, we're also told to celebrate this with the, uh, the waving of leaves and palm branches. We'll come on to that a bit later because there's lots of significance with that. It is also said to be that the time when Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. I do hope there's no one here who sincerely believes that Jesus was born on the 25th of December because you're about to be disappointed. I won't go into the maths and the calculations, but based on uh, 1 Chronicles 24 and Luke chapter 1, you can narrow down the birth of Christ to the very last week in September or the very first week in October. That would have been the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's quite fitting that in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word, Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now in the Greek there, the, the, the Greek word is eskino, and it literally means to live in a tent. To tabernacle, and that's why some translations in your Bibles will say that the word the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So that's why it is commonly believed that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, or potentially on the first or last day. So as I said, the Feast of Tabernacles remembers God's provision for the Israelites in their time in the wilderness. God sustained them. It talks about how they you know they never run out of food and their their sandals never worn out. God sustained the Israelites during their time in the wilderness whilst they lived in Boo. So we remember God's provision for the Israelites during this time. Now, as I said, we're told to wave palm branches and, and leaves to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's four particular things listed here. You've got the palm branch, the myrtle branch, the willow branch, and also traditionally you have something in Hebrew called an etrog, which is a lemon. Now, I'm sure you've all seen at the Western Wall, you'll see the Jews celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, waving these, uh, these like sticks called a lulav. They're called a lulav. And it's basically all of these uh, species of leaves tied together. They'll, they'll fasten them together. And in the left hand, they'll hold the lemon, the itrog, and they'll do various waving ceremonies with this uh, palm branch called a lulav. You'll see them doing that at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And also one of the things that they celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles with is this, this singing of the Hallel, which is Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is the Messianic Psalm. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It has to do with the coming of the Messiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, we see the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated here. When the Jews came back from 70 years of captivity in Babylon, they came back and they found all the old books of the law and they realised that they hadn't been observing the law, they hadn't been uh, celebrating the feasts that God had ordained for them. So in Nehemiah chapter 8, they kind of have this revival, and they have this, this massive Feast of Tabernacles celebration, which it says that they hadn't had one like that for centuries. Now the waving of palm branches is very significant. We see from the New Testament that 
Palm branches has to do with, it's a heavenly thing, it has to do with heaven. For example, we see in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, there's a multitude standing before the Lord. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples and tongues, standing before the throne of the Lamb, so this is taking place in heaven, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hand. So that's very significant there, it has to do with heaven. And the reason that God has told the Israelites to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles with the waving of palm branches is because the future fulfilment of it has to do with the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of God coming to earth. When Jesus returns to reign on earth, this is the fulfilment of the Feast of Tabernacles and that's why the significance of the waving of palm branches. Now of course when Jesus came the first time, they knew that the Messiah was about to show up. The Jews knew roughly the timing of the coming of the Messiah based on the prophecies of Daniel 9, which we won't go into. And of course, Jesus claimed to be the very fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, of course, they were on the lookout for a Messiah who was going to come and reign and get rid of the Romans and give them rest from their enemies. This is the kind of Messiah that they were looking for because this is what the Old Testament speaks of. The Old Testament speaks a lot about this conquering king who will return to reign on David's throne and get rid of Israel's enemies forever. But of course, when Jesus came, he didn't do this. Instead, he was crucified, but then rose again. Now that's why, of course, in Judaism, Jesus isn't accepted as the Messiah because he didn't fulfill those prophecies of the conquering king who will come and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now the rabbis today will tell us that the idea that the Messiah comes once to die for our sin but then returns to reign on David's throne, the rabbis will tell us that that's an invention of Christianity. They'll just say that's something the, the Christians have invented because Jesus didn't come and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Therefore the Christians have had to invent a new job description for the Messiah. We do know from ancient rabbinical writings long before the time of Jesus that the rabbis did understand about the two different comings of the Messiah. There's a rabbi called uh, Rabbi uh, Yehoshua ben Levi, and he wrote, he wrote long before Jesus came that there are two types of the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament. For example, in Daniel chapter 7, we see that the Messiah comes in glory on the clouds, and then in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we see that he comes humbly on a donkey. So the ancient rabbis recognised that there were two pictures of the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And of course, when Jesus came, he didn't come and fulfil those messianic prophecies. He fulfilled the ones that relate to his first coming. For example, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that he'd be born in Bethlehem. There are various prophecies that the Messiah fulfilled at his first coming. But the majority of them remain unfulfilled. Why? Because he hasn't returned yet to fulfil them, but he will. Now this is why, when Jesus was here... They were getting very impatient because Jesus was having his, uh, you know, he had his three and a half year ministry, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. But the disciples, and including John the Baptist as well, they were getting very impatient. John said, you know, he sent his disciples and said, you know, are you the Messiah or shall we wait for another? They were getting quite impatient. In other words, you know, let's get this show on the road. Let's get rid of the Romans and let's establish the kingdom of God on earth. This was the, uh, the mindset. Of, the, of not just the disciples, but the whole people. They were waiting for the Messiah to set up the kingdom of God on earth. In Matthew 16, for example, now last time I was with you, I spoke about Matthew 16, and this is the first time that we see Jesus begin to speak about his death. Before this, they were expecting Jesus to set up the messianic kingdom on earth, but then Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 21, goes to talk about his uh, death and resurrection. He began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Now look at Peter's response now. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offence to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. That's why Peter didn't want to hear this talk about Jesus being crucified. They thought he was here to set up the messianic kingdom. They didn't want to hear this talk about a Messiah who's going to come and die. They didn't understand about this. Remember, the disciples were not learned men. They were not educated. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They weren't trained like the Pharisees were. Now, Matthew 16, 28, Jesus then goes to say, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here 
who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, it's a verse which has had a lot of people puzzled because, of course, the disciples all died one or two decades after this, maybe. What Jesus is referring to here is what takes place immediately after in chapter 17, the transfiguration. The transfiguration is basically Jesus appearing in his glory, in his uh, messianic kingdom form. This is what the transfiguration is. And of course, Moses and Elijah appears with him. And this is why we're going to see that Peter believed that this was the beginning of the messianic kingdom. And we're going to see why. Matthew 17 verses 1 to 4. Now after six days... Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother. So when Jesus said, there are some among you who will not die before you see the, king, uh, the, the Messiah in his kingdom, he's referring there to Peter, James and John, his brother. He led them up on a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, take him with, uh, t- talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, now look at his response now, look at what Peter says. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Why did Peter want to build three tabernacles? Because he believed that the messianic kingdom was beginning. He thought this was the beginning of the of the millennial reign of the Messiah. So let us build three tabernacles, just like the ones you see here because he was so desperate for that messianic kingdom to begin. It's all the disciples were interested in. Now, not not so long after this, Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem on the donkey in fulfilment of the prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It was said that the Messiah would come through the east gate of the Jerusalem wall. I don't know if you've been to Jerusalem before, but the east gate is currently sealed up as it has been for the last 500 years. But the Messiah comes through the east gate in Jerusalem. So he comes in on the donkey. The people are singing, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What is that? That's the Psalm 118, the messianic psalm that they sing at the Feast of Tabernacles. Let us see Matthew 21 verses 6 to 11, because this is now... We're going to see now why these people were singing this. Matthew 21, verses 6 to 11. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before And those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So why were they waving palm branches? Because they believed that the messianic kingdom was beginning. They believed that this was the coming of the Messiah, where he was going to enter the temple and get rid of the Romans. Now, of course, when is this taking place? When did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on the donkey? It was five days before Passover. Five days before Passover. In other words, you're talking five or six months before the Feast of Tabernacles. They were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles here prematurely. Why? Because they thought the Messiah had come to set up the kingdom of God on earth. They didn't understand that he was actually first coming to die for their sin. That's why they were singing Psalm 118 known as the Hillel, which they sing at the Feast of Tabernacles, whilst waving palm branches, because they thought the Messiah was coming to reign on David's throne. Hosanna to the son of David. Now, of course, this is something they got wrong. Everyone likes to celebrate Palm Sunday, don't they? I'm sure you do that here. Most of our traditional churches like celebrating Palm Sunday. However, they normally get pretty upset when I tell them that the whole thing is based on a mistake. They were not celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in the right time. This is one week before Passover, seven months, six, uh, six months before the Feast of Tabernacles, and yet they're waving palm branches and singing Psalm 118 as if it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because they were desperate for the Messiah to come and set up the kingdom of God. However, Jesus didn't come into the temple and get rid of the Romans. Instead, he drove out the money changers and those who were setting sacrifices, didn't he? Even after Jesus was crucified and even after he rose from the dead, 
the disciples still didn't get it. They still didn't understand that the messianic kingdom was not to be set up yet. We see this in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. So when they came together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They were still desperate for him to set up the messianic kingdom and to give Israel rest from their enemies. And then the two angels said in Acts chapter 1 and 11, the same Jesus who was taken up from you to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So in other words, he'll return just as you saw him depart. Same spot as well, according to Zechariah 14. So that means that Jesus is going to come and return to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles, to establish the kingdom of God on earth and reign on David's throne. All of those Old Testament prophecies that we saw in the Old Testament will be fulfilled. For example, Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. I can, I can give you so many of these passages which speak about the millennial kingdom, the reign of the Messiah. There are so many which speak of it. A good example is found in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountains to the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. That means that there's going to be no injustice in the kingdom of God. When Jesus reigns in the kingdom of God, there will be no injustice. It will be put back to how things were meant to be. Now look what it says. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. In other words, there will be peace. Why is Jesus called the Prince of Peace? Because he's coming to bring true peace. There will be an end to war. Nations will no longer go to war against nations, but there will be eternal peace. Beware of any politician who says that they can bring in peace. That's a picture of the Antichrist. The only one who can bring in eternal peace is Jesus when he returns to fulfill the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the kingdom of God. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So that's one of many passages which describe the messianic kingdom, the reign of Jesus on earth. We see passages in Isaiah 11, for example, where it says that the lion, not the lion, but the, the, the wolf will lay down with the lamb. We've all heard that the, the lion will lay down with the lamb. It's actually the wolf in the scripture. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. In other words, animals won't have that wild nature anymore. You'll be able to just literally play with a lion in the kingdom of God. How great is that? Now, of course, we see the fulfillment of this in Revelation. This is where we see in Revelation chapter 20 exactly what these Old Testament prophecies are going to look like when they're fulfilled. Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat in them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received a mark on their foreheads, or on their hands. So all those who have been martyred in the tribulation, or all those who have been martyred in the last 2,000 years for their faith in Christ, they're going to be raised from the dead, aren't they? And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's a thousand year reign there of the Messiah on earth. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That's talking about the unsaved. That's a different subject altogether. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the Second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So what that means, brothers and sisters, is not only is Jesus going to reign on earth, but you and I are going to reign with him. You and I are going to reign with him as kings and priests. Why is Jesus called the king of kings? Because we are kings. We are priests. Why is he called the high priest? Because we are priests. We are kings. But he is the high priest and he is the king of kings. And we are going to reign with him in the kingdom of God when there shall be no more war, no more famine, no more hunger. All these things never should have been. The world like it is now is basically a result of the fall, when sin entered the world. When sin entered the world, when sin entered the world, the Lord left the world in the power of the devil. And that's why we have war, that's why we have disease, that's why we have famine, that's why we have death. 
when sin entered the world, death entered the world. It never should have been like that. So the, the millennial reign of the Messiah is going to be basically what happened if Adam and Eve had never have sinned. That's what it's going to be like. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is a fulfillment of. Jesus is going to return to reign. Now in the kingdom of God, we are going to be celebrating all of these feasts. A lot of people say, yeah, but that's all old. That's all old Jewish stuff. We don't need to celebrate that. Well, in the kingdom of God, in the thousand year reign, we are going to be celebrating these feasts every year. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, in other words, after the tribulation, shall go forth year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So we are going to be celebrating the feast of tabernacles in the kingdom. We're going to be celebrating Passover in the kingdom. In Isaiah 66, verse 23, from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind shall come to worship me, declares the Lord. We're going to be having the Sabbath in the millennial kingdom. We're going to be having the new moon. The new moon is uh, the first day of the month in, Hebrew, in the Rosh Kodesh, it is in Hebrew. It's, the, uh, it's considered the Sabbath. We're going to be celebrating all these things in the kingdom of God. So a lot of people say, oh no, but I don't like these, these feasts these Sabbaths, these new moons, it's all old Jewish stuff. Well, you won't like the kingdom of God in that place either because we are going to be celebrating these things in the millennial kingdom when Jesus returns to reign. Remember, who reigns with him? The saints. It says in Daniel that the kingdom was given to the saints. So you and I are going to reign with him and that's what our time on earth is. It's preparation for the kingdom of God. That's why God wants to use you and that's why God wants to grow you because he's preparing you for the kingdom that you're actually meant for. We were never made for this world. We are in this world, but we're not of it. You and I are citizens of heaven. And that's what our true inheritance is, the kingdom of heaven coming to earth. And you and I are going to reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years as kings and priests. I'm sure looking forward to that and getting out of this dump. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let us uh, give thanks to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much, Lord, for, uh, for this feast and all that there is to learn from this feast that you have ordained for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that even though we have sinned against you, even though, Lord, mankind has fallen into dark depravity, we thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us from that curse by sending your only begotten Son as a sacrifice for our sin, that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. And we thank you, Lord, that us who are born again, us who know you, have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. We thank you, Lord, that we shall reign with you as kings and priests, we long to see you return, Lord, to overthrow the enemies of this world, to give Israel rest from their enemies, and to see you, Lord, reign on David's throne. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that inheritance that we have, that we are no longer citizens of this world, but we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And Lord, we know that we are in this foreign land representing you, Lord, as ambassadors. Help us to be good ambassadors, Lord. Help us to shine the light of Jesus Christ in this dark world and help us Lord to be ready for when you return help us to keep our eyes open help us to be sober help us to live in the light as we look to our blessed hope as it says in Titus we long for you Lord to return and redeem us from this world and we thank you that our redemption has been completed and will be completed again Lord when you return we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the price of that redemption. And we thank you, Lord, that because of that, we are now children of the Most High God, adopted into your family. Let us go forth and proclaim that good news to others, Lord, so that others may be partakers of the kingdom of God. We do give you thanks, Lord, for this day. We give you thanks for this congregation and for this gathering of saints. But we thank you, Lord, above all for Jesus, who has brought us into the kingdom of God by his blood. We thank you for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.